we're going to talk about the myth about myths. So talk about allegories, puns, myths, and metaphors. Okay. And we have a little outline. Firstly, we're going to start with a memorial to Brother Joe Browning. Um, going to talk about, uh, give a definition of myth and allegory. I'm going to talk about the tortoise and the hare. Hope I spelled that right. I'm a notoriously terrible speller. The tortoise and the hare. Gonna, and then we're going to look at Aesop or Aesop's fables. We're going to talk about nursery rhymes and solar movements. The Wizard of Oz. Yes, we're going to talk about the Wizard of Oz, an 1890s populist movement. Harry Potter and the alchemical wedding uh, or alchemical marriage. The Christian myth related to solar and anatomy. The Lord's Prayer from the Aramaic perspective. Symbolism related to Wasir, Asar, and uh, Osiris. So first thing, memorial to uh, Brother Joe Browning. And uh, when I first did this um, PowerPoint, Joe Browning had just passed away. And Joe Browning is, uh, was an associate member of Wolsey Community. He actually was a pastor of a Church of God in Christ. And uh, one of the people that attend our service, Cecilia, invited him uh, to one of our services and he recognized me from San Francisco State. And I sort of recognized him. And, uh, but when I looked at him physically, he just reminded me of Dr. Ben. I told him that and he knew who Dr. Ben was. So we just kind of hit it off. And uh, you know, he was really struggling with the church that he was at because he kept, he would, he would go to the eight o'clock service and then get, then scoot over uh, to our services and be in there by 11. He was an Im impeccably dressed person. And, um, you know, it, it was just such a shock. And, and one of the things that he was really trying to, to get started here was a tutorial program uh, where we would uh, tutor uh, African-American children on um, uh, math and science. And um, so, and, and we would be working with uh, teachers and tutors uh, from uh, Sac State. Anyway, uh, Joe uh, had some kidney issues. Actually, he, he, was, he was on dialysis every day. And, uh, you know, uh, we didn't know that uh, till the end. And, uh, uh, you know, he passed on to the ancestors, uh, to the creator, and here he is with some of us at a 60th birthday party for me a couple of years ago. So I uh, just want to pour a mental libation for uh, Brother Joe Browning. All right, let's get started. So myth, uh, myth, it originates from the Greek word mythos, meaning word, word. Uh, tale or true narrative. Um, it's uh, rooted in truth. That's what a myth is. It also um, is related to the word myo, meaning to teach or to initiate into the mysteries. And this is how the word was interpreted by Homer, uh, who lived in the seventh and eighth century BC. Uh, who wrote uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey in which he meant to convey a truth. And I uh, got this information from a guy named John Black, who was an engineer and researcher and Arthur. So there's a difference between allegory and metaphor. So the main difference between allegory and metaphor is that an allegory is a piece of literature where characters, images, or events act as symbols, and metaphors is a literary device that makes a comparison between two unrelated things. An allegory is sometimes classified as an extended met uh, metaphor. 
So, you know, I put this little slide in. So, you know, allegory is a piece of literature. You know, a metaphor is a literary device. Allegory adds a hidden meaning to the text. Uh, metaphor compares two unrelated things. Allegory uses symbolism. Metaphor uses imagery. Allegories have a hidden meaning which relates to uh, morality or politics and metaphors don't have a hidden meaning. So that's, that's how we're describing them. So the first one we wanna look at uh, is the tortoise and the hare in Aesop's fable. So, you know, if you're like me, you grew up watching a lot of uh, Warner Brothers cartoons and I think this is an early representation of Bugs Bunny. And they had a cartoon called The uh, Tortoise and the Hare. So, but really the tortoise and the hare has to do with this. Metaphorically, the tortoise represents the earth. The hare represented the moon. The race of the tortoise and the hare represents the respective revolutionary movements of the two bodies. So the hair as the moon is fast. It, it completes a revolution around the earth in about 30 days. You know, it's, it's speedy. It's all over. It jumps all over the place. But in the fable, the uh, hair is depicted as literally running circles around the tortoise. The earth is much slower. It completes its revolution in 365 and a quarter days. But what do we find in the denouncement of the fable? The hare, in its overconfidence, decides to take a short nap, just, uh, uh, just short of the finish line, while the tortoise continues to plod along until he crosses it. So astronomically, the finish line is the completion of the 365 and a quarter days. The lunar year, whether it's 354 days or 364 days, falls short of this complete year. Thus, the hare falls short of the finish line and while the tortoise uh, crosses it. So that's really what they're talking about. They're not talking. I know uh, in a sense it says, well, you know, one is overconfident, but one, and so he falls short and the other one just keeps plodding along. But in a larger macro view, it's actually talking about the astronomical movements of the earth and the moon. So, um, and also lending weight to this interpretation is, is there's a circular construction of the race course. So read astronomically, Aesop, uh, where this comes from, was preserving a record of the official establishment in antiquity of the solar year. So uh, at first, uh, you know, people uh, would use what's called the stellar calendar, which was based upon the, the stellar movements. And, but that calendar only yielded uh, 360 days. And then people fell back and, and um, started looking at the, uh, the, the lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar is very important because if it were not for the lunar calendar, we would not be here because we are here based upon our mother's cycle that's, that's intimately connected to the lunar cycle. So as the basis for the administrative and, and liturgical calendars in the Nile Valley and elsewhere, so what he was doing was talking about uh, the establishment of the solar calendar uh, having precedent being more accurate uh, than the lunar calendar. So. And this all comes from the book that we discussed last time, 
Star of Deep Beginning by Dr. Charles Finch. Now, when I first heard about Aesop, it was from watching, I watched a lot of cartoons growing up, and perhaps you did too, Rocky and Bullwinkle. And there was a whole suite of other uh, cartoons, uh, and one dealt with Aesop and his son. And you know, this is the way it would open up, and Aesop would chisel his name on that thing. And then his son takes a pile driver and puts, and son, and then the father just, you know, kind of shrugs and says, okay, that's my son. And then they would go on and proceed to tell one of Aesop's fables. But Aesop was a brother. That's right. Aesop was a brother. And uh, his, his name, you can kind of see the word Ethiop in uh, the, in his name. He's described as having dark skin, a wide nose, a stutter that could indicate that he had a foreign accent. Uh, his, his fables were about animals, um, not Greek animals, but African animals, apes, lions, crocodiles, elephants, jackals, lions, monkeys, etc. And uh, J.A. Rogers is, is the person that tells us, one of the people anyway, that tells us that Aesop was a brother. And he, he says that in, he does, I don't know how many of you have this book. The, the, his, all of J.A. Rogers' books uh, should be looked at, but the one that we're talking about today is World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1. And so World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1, it, it, it has uh, women as well. And it talks about people in the, in the so-called old world. So Africa, Europe, uh, Asia. And then uh, Volume 2 has uh, people in the uh, so-called new world, uh, Antonio Maceo, Nat Turner, and, and other people like that. So. Dr. Uh, J.A. Rogers, she's not doctor, but J.A. Rogers was uh, born in the grill, Jamaica, and he died in New York in, in the 60s. And he was a historian, a journalist, an author who, whose works made great contributions to the history of Africa and its diaspora. Um, just, uh, I, I wanna ask, how many have heard of Dr. Uh, 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 excuse me, of, of J.A. Rogers. Uh, just, you can shout out now. Okay, you can just, anybody? Yes. Uh, that's Shashem? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have, I have a few of his books, yeah. Okay, Bobby, who else? Anybody else? Yes. Who's that? Uh, Katabazi. Katabazi, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, got it too, you, you got it too, to uh, Obasi? Yes, Obasi? sir. All right, so so yeah, uh, you know, a very pro prolific writer. He wrote uh, Sex and Race, Volume One, Two, and Three. Nature Knows No Color Line, uh, From Man to Superman, uh, World's Great Men of Color. You know, he, so he wrote all these books. He wrote Africa's Gift to America, and uh, you know, just really way ahead of his time. And he was a Pullman Porter. And he financed his scholarship and his travel to various places uh, on a Pullman Porter's uh, salary. So he was very uh, dedicated. So uh, this is what he says. He says that uh, Aesop's early life is, you know, we don't know too much about it. Uh, he wrote in the latter half of the fifth century BC, it says that he lived during the commission uh, time of uh, the Per uh, Amosis of the sixth century, and he was uh, connected to the land of Samos. And uh, Herodotus gives evidence that he may have been a slave or a relative uh, to a, a citizen of, of Samos called uh, e, uh, e Adman. E Adman, and there's, um, it, there's the Per uh, that I was talking about. And so in World's Great Men of Color, volume one, pages 73 to 79, 
uh, he talks about, uh, you know, his early life. And, uh, and again, he's described flat nose with lips thick and uh, black skin and uh, you know you can see the word you, you know Ethiopia in, or Ethiop in his name Aesop or Aesop. Also now uh, I always there's a sister up here in, in Sacramento and she just celebrated her 70th birthday and uh, she was uh, on our council of elders she was keeper of the records she's a librarian uh, by uh, profession and she was a librarian at uh, uc uh, davis medical center uh, but and so to me she kind of looks like drusilla dungy houston drusilla dungy houston wrote this work that asa hilliard tells us about it's called wonderful ethiopians of the ancient Kushite empire. And uh, she wrote this in 1926 in Oklahoma. And so she was an American writer, historian, educator, journalist, musician, and screenwriter. She's originally from West Virginia. And she became an independent historian beginning in 1901. Now you just imagine a black woman writing about black people's history and culture in 1901, she conducted research into a variety of sources and published a multi-volume history of Africans in the homeland, wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite empire. So uh, let me go back, I think I missed something here. So she said, uh, uh, oh no, okay. oh, whoops, I didn't mean to go back, back that far, come back, let me see. All right, so uh, this, this last thing says, while her work is dated, it was very in influential as part of the early 20th century. So she, she wrote uh, a lot about African history, and this is what she says about Aesop. She says, African t t uh, may Africans tell many tales like those of Aesop. Many nations claim Aesop. This was because he was a Kushite of which there were all divisions. So by identity of race, he belonged to all of them. Tradition said that he was black and deformed. It is very likely he was part of the life of Alexandria, Egypt, and the cities of Asia Minor. So anyway, Aesop was a brother. And this is, this next slide kind of gives us, you know, this is how, um, Europeans portrayed uh, people that they called Ethiopians. And Ethiopian uh, is not the, the kind of Ethiopians that you see today that's at your favorite um, Ethiopian restaurant, Blue Nile, um, you know, Asmara, Queen of Sheba. Uh, uh, this, you know, they look like, oh, by the way, in Ethiopia, there are 20 different ethnic groups. And uh, the people that we see are part of the Shoah people or Amhara people, and they speak Amharic. But when we, when we talk about Ethiopians, uh, this is the way that the Greeks saw them. They, 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 uh, they connected them with the Colchians and uh, the, the ancient Egyptians and et cetera. So they wrote about uh, the Ethiopians. They were influenced by the Ethiopians. And then they later uh, came and, and uh, conquered uh, uh, parts of Kemet. But they, even though they conquered them, they still had an a, um, a, a admiration and um, a respect for the ancient cultures of, uh, of our lands. So now I'm going to talk about some nursery rhymes. And I'm not going to use the traditional nursery rhymes when my children were growing up, we read uh, nursery rhymes to them that were illustrated by Fred Crump Jr. And Fred Crump Jr., Chingara, all right, good, good that you can make us make it. Um, Fred Crump Jr. Uh, was a, a brother who uh, put together a lot of nursery rhymes. So these next few slides, instead of using like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he says Ebonina and the seven boys. But anyway, 
that story is talking about the sun. So Snow White is the sun as a beautiful white aura. And the undifferentiated color of the sun is one white light, which gets differentiated into seven colors, which are the seven dwarfs. Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood is the sun. She represents the sun. As the sun sets in the western horizon, the ancients always placed the scales of Libra in the western sunset, where from time to time, the sun sets with its red color. So the scales of Libra uh, begin at the horizon and go uh, 30 degrees below the horizon. So when mama tells Little Red Riding Hood, don't stop and see anybody, you've got to go direct. That's what the sun does. Out of the seven planets in the sky that we can visibly see, the sun is the only one uh, that does that. And here, um, you know, we're talking about astronomy. So part of uh, the constellation of Libra, it has what's called decans. And uh, one of those decans is lupus, the wolf. So the wolf comes along. The wolf is one of, the, like I said, one of the, the, de the, the decans or deacons. You know, this is where we get deacons in the church of Libra, where the sun sets every day and is always on the horizon. When Little Red Riding Hood comes out of the other side of the horizon, she is saved by Orion, the hunter, and lives to see another day. So uh, the ancients put the cosmological uh, observances in these nursery rhymes. And here, now I have this uh, uh, poster in my um, room here, and I got it in 1987 at the Nature Company. Uh, some of you may remember the Nature Company. You could, you could go there and you could just get a whole bunch of neat stuff there that, that you can become geeked out on like somebody like me. So this map actually shows the uh, known universe. It has the, where the red giants are and the super giants and the quasars and the novas and all where all the black holes are. And um, I'm going to uh, stop this here and just um, uh, really belabor this and just show you more than you ever want to know about this. But um, so on this, here you can see the scales of Libra here. And this is all part of Libra. And here is where Lupus is, you know, on an astronomical chart. Now for you Scorpios, here's Scorpio. And there is a red giant right in the middle of Scorpio. And the uh, archer in Sagittarius is shooting at the black hole in Scorpio's tail. Okay, that's a digression, I know. I'm gonna keep going now. Any questions, any comments so far? Uh, speak up. Hello. So, so all of these um, stories so far, all of these are Aesop stories? No. No, Riding Hood and... no, 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 no. The, uh, the Aesop stories are uh, the Aesop story I, that I used was was only the I'm glad you asked that was only the uh, tortoise and the hare. Mm. Now I'm not really sure who put together these uh, these nursery rhymes, but it's something that you know at one time or another we've all heard about, and we've just kind of you know like last week we were talking about the Dogon, and we were talking about looking at the word forward, and then looking at the word to the side and looking at the word backward and looking at the clear word. And, and so that's, you know, I'm kind of continuing on that. Uh, Minister Ahmadi asked that question, you know, can you give us an example of, you, you know, something like that? So that's kind of what I'm addressing uh, somewhat in this, um, in, in this uh, PowerPoint, but no, these other things are not Aesop. I'm glad you asked that question. And Emma, Anyone else? They've kind of lost their meaning, um, like Sleeping Beauty, those stories that 
or in like the Western world, they don't have that deep meaning that you're talking about, right? Right, right. Well, you know, all, all you know, there's so much, uh, this is nausea, right? Yes. So there's, there's a profound meaning in a lot of different things. So, so just for instance, uh, you, you, you may have seen a deck of cards. How, how many cards are in a deck of cards? How many, how many weeks are in a year? 52. How many, how many picture cards are in uh, a deck of cards? How many, well, four, three in, a, three in a set, so three times four, 12? 12. So how many months are in a year? Uh-huh, 12. Yeah, and then how and then how many seasons? Four. Oh, okay. You, you know, so these things are, are before us and, and, and there's 13 uh you know uh uh, uh yeah so anyway uh you, you know these things are are before us mm. all, all the time and so I'm I'm talking about so the so the, the, the topic of this uh, discussion is the myth of myths. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty. Um, so she's the earth. She's an earth goddess. And so in the myth, in Sleeping Beauty, the earth goddess sinks into the long winter sleep when she's pricked by the point of a spindle. And in her cosmic palace, she's locked up in an icy repose. Uh, <clears throat> nothing can thrive save, save the ivy, which defies the coal until she's kissed by the golden haired sun god, which reawakens life and activity. So that's that Sleeping Beauty story. Cinderella mm -hmm. and Prince Charming. Cinderella's the dawn, Prince Charming is the sun. Same story, different characters, different names. Uh, four and twenty blackbirds. Four and twenty blackbirds are the are the four and twenty hours in a day. The pie that holds them is the underlining earth, covered by the overarching sky. The twenty four blackbirds are the twenty four hours in a day. Um, and then there, you know, when the 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 pie is opened or day breaks, then the birds begin to sing. You know, so. That's how people explained things, uh, you know, so that we would not lose them. The, the king is the sun, and, and when he's counting his money, he's pouring out the sunshine, the golden shower of, of Danai. Uh, the queen is the moon, and her transparent honey is, is the moonlight. <clears throat> the maid is the rosy-fingered dawn who rises before the sun, her master and hangs out the clouds, his clothes, across the sky. And uh, so, and then one of the, one of the uh, blackbirds uh, snips off her nose and that's uh, the hour of sunrise. So uh, that's how we explain that. There's also another meaning in uh, Little Red Riding Hood. So uh, in, this, in this particular meaning, uh, she's the evening sun, which is always described as red or golden. Uh, the old grandmother is the, is the earth to whom the rays of the sun bring warmth and comfort. The wolf is the well-known figure for clouds and blackness of the sky. It's also kind, sometimes referred to as a dragon in another form. So first he devours the grandmother, that is, he wraps the earth in thick clouds, which which the evening sun is not strong enough to pierce through. And then when, then with the darkness of the night, he swallows up the evening sun itself and all is dark and desolate. And this is a German tale. So, um, you know, this is a way after um, uh, Aesop. Uh, the night uh, thunder and the wind storms are represented by the snorting of the wolf. And then the huntsman, the morning sun comes with all of his strength and majesty and chases away the night clouds and kills the wolf and revives the grandmother, which is the earth, and brings Little Red Riding Hood back to life. So, um, you know, 
and also it could mean, you know, winter and uh, spring returning. So Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm just going to keep uh, moving because, uh, mm -hmm. oh, Beauty and the Beast. I'm going to skip Beauty and the Beast too, unless you really want to see Beauty and the Beast. Speak up now. So this is uh, the Fred Crump Jr. collection. And you might say, well, who was Fred Crump? Fred Crump uh, was a brother. He was born in Houston, Texas. And uh, he received his master's in art. Uh, he moved to Palm Springs, taught junior high for 32 years after retiring. His teaching career, he began to author children's uh, books, including teaching and writing and illustrating. And uh, he wrote in magazines such as Humpty Dumpty and Playmate and Turtle. And he brought the fairy tales of, of childhood to African-American children in a way that they could personally identify with them. He passed on to the ancestors in 2005 at the age of 72. Uh, and his final book was Three Kings and a Star, was, was released the month before his death. And uh, I provided here a uh, link uh, that you can copy down uh, uh, if, you, if you so desire, or you could just do a search on Fred Crump Jr. And I, I really looked for his picture but well, this is the only picture that I could find. And this was a drawing done of him by one of his students. So kind of looks like Neely Fuller Jr. a little bit. And those of you that are familiar with him. And so moving on, now we're getting ready to talk about The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz was written in 1890s and it carried a secret message that wasn't decoded until 1964, which is probably the first time I saw it. So again, I'm not using the traditional characters from The Wizard of Oz, I'm using the black characters. So I'm not using Julie, Gar Julie Garland and <clears throat> Ray Bolger and others. I'm using Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, uh, Nipsey Russell, and of course, Richard Pryor. So now historians found a number of symbols in the Wizard of Oz and they all point to one thing, American politics in the 1890s when Baum was writing uh, this book. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip some of that. So the Wizard of Oz, now, you know, this might find, uh, you know, sound far, far-fetched and you know like we're reaching but you know, it has some political allegories in it um, and but it's taught through like a child's tale and that's and that's what happens you know people tell little simple tales in it you know people tell little simple tales to convey a profound message so Baum, I think that's how his name is pronounced, was a political reporter in the 1890s. He lived in South Dakota for seven years, giving him a close-up view of the rise of popular, of the populist movement and the views of American workers and farmers. So this is really about the struggle between American workers, American farmers, uh, the pirate elite, you know, the bankers, the, the railroad owners, the politicians, and so that, so what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to just take a little, uh, uh, a little trek uh, through the Wizard of Oz, looking at it from a political standpoint. So there's a lot of parallels. So let's let's just look. So now Dorothy. Dorothy represents the average American. In the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is an orphan living in Kansas a dull gray place that's lost its vibrancy. And according to Quentin Taylor, Dorothy represents each of us at our best, the kind but self-respecting, guileless but level-headed, wholesome but plucky uh, a girl next door. She represents the average American looking for a solution to her simple problem. In the 1890s and 1880s and 1890s, the state of Kansas was going through a terrible time. Droughts, 
harsh winters, invading grasshoppers, uh, scorched the prairie. You know, it was, it was not. You know, uh, what was that? What was that movie with uh, Henry Fonda? Um, Grapes of Wrath. You know, you know, it was just a really an awful time. So devastated farmers uh, blamed all sorts of forces, Wall Street, the railroads, politicians, even nature itself. In fact, the tribulations of American farmers gave rise to the populist movement, which promised solution. And so the Wizard of Oz came, contained coded symbolism that supported popularism. So the first character that we have is the scarecrow. And the scarecrow represents Midwest farms. The poor scarecrow and the, and the Wizard of Oz is convinced that he doesn't have a brain. And uh, he has this inferiority complex because uh, you know people would accuse farmers in those days of ignorance, of being irrational, uh, you know, being uh, uh, muddle-headed. And uh, the populist movement, uh, new to the scene at the, eight, at the end of the 1800s, was pri primarily made of farmers who were mocked by everybody. Yes, somebody uh, had something to say? Did somebody, I see somebody sent me something. Hold on, just one minute. I see that Bobby, oh, okay, thanks. Uh, is that a picture? Let me see what Bob, no, you know what, Bobby, that's not him. That's somebody else. I, I, I saw that image and, and, and it's not, that's not Fred Crump Jr. That's not the Fred Crump Jr. That's another Fred Crump Jr. that we're talking about. Thanks, thanks for looking, I appreciate it. So the, the Scarecrow, they were mocked by people. And so they were told, you know, they're, they're just dumb and they didn't have a brain. And so they were deluded simpletons and radicals. That's what they were called. But the scarecrow proves that he isn't stupid and he shows common sense and, and resilience over his journey. And so this story implies that farmers are not as stupid as, po as political opponents would suggest. All right, the Tin Man is the mistreated factory worker. So in the 1890s, the US was in the middle of an industrial revolution. And that shift created a lot of workers who weren't being treated well by their bosses. Where have you heard this uh, uh, before? And so he represents a dehumanized worker who was literally turned into tin by the wicked witch of the East. The tin man was once a strong, healthy worker, but after the witch cursed him, he accidentally chucked chopped off his limb and each one was replaced with tin, transforming the worker into the tin man. The tin man represents the factory worker who has lost his heart in the new economy. And so the symbolism goes even deeper because the tin man is rusted. And when Dorothy meets him, paralleling the high unemployment during the depression, in the 1890s, he's ready to work as Dorothy demonstrates by giving him just a few drops of oil. All right, so there's this guy, his name is uh, William Jennings Bryant. And uh, Bryant and lion is kind of like a play on words. And so he's the cowardly lion. He's a, he's a populist hero and um, you know, he was really a, a spokesperson. He was portrayed as a lion in the press. He was, he was, he was a, a great spokesperson for the populist movement. Uh, he ran for president as a Democratic candidate in 1896 and, eight, and 1900. He promoted the free silver movement, arguing that America's gold standard was harming workers. And so he, in his famous cross of gold speech, he, he railed that having behind us the commercial interests and the labor interests, all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands for gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the, the brow of the labor 
uh, uh, the, 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 you know, this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify him on the cross of gold. So one of the things that's going back and forth is the, the uh, struggle between the gold standard and the silver standard. He was un unable to win either election in part because, uh, you know, he couldn't win over Eastern workers. And so uh, just like the cowardly lion's claws, he could make no impression on the Tin Man. And this is how he's depicted, you know, when they would make uh, uh, cartoons about him. Um. So now, uh, when we think about the, uh, uh, I'm going to stop here. Are there any questions, any comments, anything you want to say, anything you want to ask, anyone that want to step up and uh, uh, not make this a monologue, but actually a discussion? It's also interesting. I just want to hear more. <laughs> Yeah, it's fascinating. I think we're kind of just going with you, and we love and we love it. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just, I just want you know because the way my screen is now, I can't see everybody, and and maybe that's good. Like like okay, Amadi, your 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 uh, picture just just popped up, and before that was uh, Katabasi's. So uh, I'm just going to keep on going. So the silver slipper, there's actually silver slippers, not ruby slippers, because. When this movie came out, um, uh, you know, Technicolor was just happening. And so, you know, at the beginning of the movie, it's black and white. And then when, when, when she wakes up in Oz, you know, everything is in color. And so they made this, you know, you know just as an artistic expression, they made the silver slippers ruby slippers. So the mm -hmm. secret's in the silver slippers. So the beautiful ruby slippers in the movie, oh, I just said that, okay, didn't exist so. They were silver slippers, all right. They were, okay, I talked about that. But once you realize the, the slippers were originally silver, the political message becomes loud and clear. Farmers wanted to return to the free silver to protect them from economic harm caused by the gold standard. And in the Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz, the yellow brick road represents gold. It's, it's a dangerous mm -hmm. path. So uh, it leads to the Emerald City, representing the, the link between the gold standard and the political interests. Uh, it is full of cracks and holes. And uh, the bricks were uneven and sometimes broken or missing altogether. So the scarecrow representing the farmer, he felt he would fall into the bricks again and again. You know, if you if you uh, recall the story, you know, he's, he's always tripping over himself and just, you know, not being able to walk straight because of the way this road is designed. And But Dorothy's silver slippers carries her sl safely around the damage, hinting that returning to silver and gold standard was the solution to the economic problems in the 1890s. And just to make it extra clear, uh, the Wizard of Oz is a, that the Wizard of Oz is about the monetary policy. Baum named the, the imagery land Oz the same abbreviation for ounce for the measure of gold and silver. So I mean, there's a lot of little hints, you know, in this. Yeah. So. Uh, and so then you have the wicked witches, and they represent powerful political interests in America. So the two, uh, mm -hmm. the two, uh, you know, we're, you know, they're, they're the the interests uh, in American politics that threaten the country. Which, okay, you know, when you think about today, this this is still going on. So the wicked witch of the East, who Dorothy smashes with her house is a thinly veiled reference to Wall Street and all the money interest in the 1890s, which, okay, it's still going on. Yeah, uh, she, she represents financial industrial interest. She is the one who stole the Tin Man's heart and she enslaved the Munchkins. You know, and then you have the Wicked Witch of the West. 
And, and so she's symbolizing the rich interests of the West. She represents the bankers, the, the railroad owners, the wealthy oil men like J.D. Rockefeller. And just as the Wicked Witch of the East, she enslaves the Munchkins, the witch, uh, the, uh, the witch in the West enslaves the Winkies who represent Asian laborers in the West. Mm. The, the Winkies, that's, that's, that's cold. And, okay. Um, <laughs> She is finally, now, now check this out. She is finally dissolved with water. Another allusion to the monetary debate over liquidity. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's subtle. If you're, not, if you're not looking at it in this way, mm -hmm. then you would totally miss it. So it turns out a lot of the Wizard of Oz is about fiscal policy. You know, on one mm -hmm. end, it looks like a young jerk. Uh, a young girl's journey to find her way back home and she realizes that she had the power within her all along. But according to scholars who see political symbolism in the story, it's also about monetary policy. That's right. <clears throat> in the 1890s, the big debate in, Mel in American politics was about the gold standard. Under the gold standard, America's paper currency was backed by gold and anyone could take a dollar to the bank and receive a dollar's worth of gold. Now, you know, just moving fast forward, Nixon changed uh, the uh, changed the American uh, uh, currency from the gold standard to what uh, many call fiat money. So right now, the dollar is not backed by any metal, and it's really backed by the way people feel about it. You know it. There are no reserves in the Federal Reserve, and, and it's not a federal agency. But that's another topic. But keeping on, so the gold standard was causing huge monetary problems for the American farmers. Prices were falling. Farmers were defaulting on their loans. Banker, bankers were seizing their farms, selling them off. Many farmers lost their jobs, lost their homes. And many farmers blamed the gold standard. So by 1873, a dollar could be exchanged, be, excuse me, before 1873, a dollar could be exchanged for gold or silver. And so the farmers wanted to return to the free silver because the amount of silver would cause inflation and make it easier for farmers to pay back their loans. So all of this may seem removed mm -hmm. from the Wizard of Oz until you uh, consider two things. The importance of the yellow brick road representing gold, Dorothy's slippers, which weren't which weren't ruby in the book, they were silver. So they weren't gold, they were silver. Yeah. All right, and then the flying monkeys. The flying monkeys. So the flying monkeys do the evil bidding of the wicked witch of the West. And according to Littlefield, they represent the Plains Indians who were still fighting for their survival, for fighting against the United States government in the 1800s. Baum's description of the flying monkeys makes the connection clear because at some point, one of the leaders of the flying monkeys says this. He says, he says we were free people living happily in the forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruits, and doing just as we please without calling anybody master. But all that changed when Oz arrived to rule over this land. And, uh, but now this guy that wrote, that wrote this bomb, L. Franklin Bomb, he had strong opinions against uh, American Indians and they, and they were, his opinions were super racist. And so this is what he said. He said, the whites by law of conquest by justice of civilization are masters of the American continent and the best safety of the frontier settler settlements will be secured by the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Why not annihilation? My goodness. I, I know, I know it's, it's just horrific when you think, why, why do people <laughs> think like that? By advocating for genocide, he added, Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect, 
protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe out these untamed, untainable creatures from the face of the earth. Ooh. So uh, what, what kind of logic is that? <laughs> That's the logic. Yeah. The logic is, you know, I'm taking your stuff, and and you know, and if you're not around to fight over it, then I'm better off. Oh, you know? yeah. and, and and it's still going. So a lot of these things we talk about, you know, that was in the 1800s and stuff, they're still going on. So with mm. these kind of views, it's no surprise that uh, Bomb made the flying monkeys evil. You know that could be applicable to um, the African-American population here. Yeah. There's still a lot of people who feel that the wrongs have been so great against the African-Americans that um, uh, given an opportunity or given some real power and strength, there would, would be some retributions against the dominant culture. So I know a lot of, uh, a lot of a lot of whites hold those views. Is that, uh, you, you, and you know. know what that says to me, Kat, is that um, every time I say that, I, I, I hope you don't think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm insulting you by shortening your name. So I hope, I hope that's- No, 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 you know. no problem. Okay, okay. okay, good, good, good. So you know what that also says is that they, they believe in Mott and they, and, and, and they, and they know what goes around comes around. And that, around. That, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's, one of the, that's one of the things that it says to me when you when you yeah. contemplate that. Yeah. But the thing about it is that, but another thing about the European imperative is that they feel that they can actually supersede nature and control nature. So even as they believe in my art, they still believe that they can be the one group that can over overtake my art you know, and defeat my eye, just like they seek to defeat nature. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know what, that's, that's one of the things that when I, I know this is a little bit of digression, but when I think about global warming, I'm, I'm still not convinced that it's man-made, uh, you know, and I know that's, that's uh, anathema and heresy to even say that uh, these days, but I, I look at the cycles of the world and you know, the sun is on a cycle and you know, there's there's the sun's on eleven year cycle, and and it's and and it's about to start shooting out you know sunspots again. And so we don't know anything about that. We're not trying to live in harmony with nature. We're trying to overcome nature. We're trying to mm -hmm. we're we're trying to fight nature, and yeah. and that's the losing battle because you're never going to win that. You know, you're ne wow. you're never going to win the the fight over nature. I'm going to keep going. Thank you for the thank you for those two observations, brothers. So we're, mm -hmm. we're getting to the Emerald City. The Emerald City is actually Washington, D.C. So the goal of, of uh, Dorothy's journey is to, is to go through Oz, at least initially, to reach the Emerald City, the magical place where will solve all of her problems and the mysterious Wizard of Oz will help her return to Kansas. But Dorothy's initial optimism about the beautiful city quickly evaporates. Mm. So it represents Washington, D.C. And although Dorothy, the average American, believes that the en entrance into the capital city will solve all their problems, they soon realize that the city, like the wizard, are more mi mirage than, than, than uh, real. So the wizard is the president <coughs> whose power is just an illusion. You know, Richard Pryor played that in, in one uh, instance, and then the other was uh, Queen Latifah. Oh, by the way, I remember when this movie came out, uh, one of the things that the critics said was, uh, the only thing that stood out in this movie was the veins in Diana Ross's neck. Cause she was playing, you know, she's like, she's like a 40 year old woman playing a teenager, you know, but uh, because it was a Motown uh, movie, you know, she got to play Dorothy because of uh, Barry Gordy. Okay, although the wizard claims to be great and powerful, he's actually a charlatan. Ooh. The wizard is a little bumbling man behind a facade of paper mache and noise, making him any president from Grant to McKinley, and you know, just extend that to any president, rather yeah. than playing that, you know, so rather than using a specific person, they use the wizard symbolically 
of the presidency itself. Just like a politician, the wizard says, I never grant favors without some return. And that reminds me of Bob Marley's song. Cat, you might remember this song. It's called Revelation. And, and, and one of the lines, it says, never make a politician grant you a favor. They will always want to control you forever. <laughs> that, that, Bob was yeah, such a, Bob was such a, 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 a poet. You know, he could, he could he really weave was. things in his songs. So the wizard, so this, so the wizard asked Dorothy to kill the wicked witch of the West. So this reveals that he don't really have any power. Because if he was great, he wouldn't need a little girl to carry out his orders. So mm -hmm. like American presidents, the wizard's power was an illusion. And in many ways, he was less power, powerful than the two wicked witches. So there's symbolism everywhere. The cyclone um, represents the rise of pop populism in the in the which swept up the Midwest. The poppy fields represent the anti-imperialist movement, which distracted William Jennings Bryant from monetary issues and thus putting him to sleep. Even Dorothy's companion Toto has been imagined as a symbol of prohibition uh, because he towed it along soberly behind it. So there's sim symbolism in everywhere. The two good witches represent the supporters of popu populism. Uh, the good witch of the North symbolizes the upper Midwest who voted for Bryan in 1896 election and propelled populism to, to the national stage. <clears throat> Glenda, the good witch of the South, represents Southern populists who argued in favor of free silver like Glenda as the only one who understands the power of Dorothy's shoes. So the East and West were against populism and they were evil, while the North and South were good for supporting populism. Uh, and, and, the three, and these three colors come up in the Wizard of Oz. Gold, silver, and green, the colors of money. By the way, uh, you know, this getting back to our astronomical thing, the moon represents money. The moon represents money. And one of the, one of the moon um, representations is Isis. And when you draw money, what do you do? You draw like a S with a with a line through it, you know, symbolizing for ISIS. Mm -hmm. All right, so the Oz operates on two levels, one literal and the other symbolic and, and political. Its capacity to fascinate on both levels testifies to some remarkable uh, Arthur's wit and ingenuity. So any comments before we go on to Harry Potter? Why are you talking about Harry Potter, Minister Mhotep, in this class? Because I'm talking about the myth of myths. Hey, Brother Damani, how you doing? I got hey, you. Hey, right. I, got hey. I just got one comment. Hi, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, in the Web of Debt, um, uh, Elaine Brown's book. In the first chapter, she talks about the uh, Wizard of Oz. She explains all the stuff you ex explained, Minister Mhotep. Is it's that right? Friend. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning. I'm going to have to get that book. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she considered um, the Witch of the East, when the house fell on the uh, Wicked Witch of the East, that represented uh, J.P. Morgan and the um, and the guy was running for president. And, uh, oh, man, Garfield just had his name. Um, you know, I'll think of a minute. Grover maybe Cleveland, maybe? maybe? Grover Cleveland, exactly. Gro that represented the uh, Grover, Cle Grover Cleveland said he had never let the government in the banking business. And, um, and so that represented the Wicked Witch of the East. The Wicked Witch of the, uh, of the West, you're right, it was represented by Rockefeller, McKinley, and Hannah Clan. Mm, mm. Yeah, in the 1930s, uh, they finally broke up Rockefeller Standard Oil into 30, 32, 34 companies. Wow. Yeah. Well, man, you, yeah. 
Yeah, but go ahead. The, the average person walking around doesn't have all this understanding in their head. So what's the point? Well, the point is that uh, we're talking about myths. So you're a little bit more uh, advanced than the average person, you know? And so the point is, I guess, to look deeper into things, that things aren't just stories, that, that we, need to, we need to make a penetrating analysis anytime we see a movie, anytime we read a book, anytime somebody tells you something in a, on a political uh, show, you need to say, what does this all mean? We need to look for the, the hidden meaning uh, behind it. Could you have figured that out without um, some keys, without having you have Absol a link that out? Absolutely. The average person couldn't have figured that out, right? Absolutely not. No. Okay. No. Okay. No. And yeah, that was that leads to my question. Now these analyses are they coming from um, scholars, uh, uh, teachers, or or people that have just delved into it to do these uh, in depth analyses? All, all, all of these. All of the above. So that's why I gave uh, that's why I gave websites on on those. So I, I believe. Hold on. Let me uh, get out of here. And I believe uh, that I gave a website that you could uh, visit to find what Mo is talking about on this crazy thing. So um, yeah. So. I opened up, I think, that section with this. So you could go to that website. I'm gonna leave it up so you can, uh, or you might take your phone, I don't know, and take a picture of it. But, um, you know, I'm gonna leave this up. So that's where I'm getting this information. I don't want you to just think, hey, you know, Elmo's really brilliant. It just, it just came to him in, in meditation and he, and he came up with, with all of this uh, penetrating analysis. No, uh, this is where I got it from. So, all right. And one thing uh, as it relates to mythology and symbolism, there are, you know, what you might would call archetypal patterns. In yes. other words, the, yes. the, these are truth, truth principles, you know, that, that unfold. And so sometimes when you look deep into something, then you can get a message because you're able to pick up on some of these eternal patterns that are always repeating themselves and they kind of unfold in a certain you know, cyclical way. And so that's yeah. what also what helps us when we're looking at symbolism and, 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 and this kind of stuff, just to kind of help us to understand and, and look to the truth about things. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, Mama Darnisha has put the, this link of Wizard of Oz in the chat. Thank you, Mama Darnisha, for that. So if you guys look in the chat, you'll be able to um, uh, find that information. So. Um, I'm going, we might go a little over and the wow meeting isn't happening. So you guys let me know if you want to continue. Uh, so it is 613 now. We can are. I, can we I are, say something real quick? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. And just to kind of add, if you don't look beneath the surface, it's easy to be fooled. Mm. They can tell you anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to look beneath the surface, a little deep meaning just for GP for general. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, you know, you can't take things at face value. Now, let me just give you an example. This is this is something that I noticed as a, I wasn't quite 21 when this happened, but do you remember the Jonestown um, um, yeah. uh, event yeah. that happened? Mm -hmm. It was in October of, of 1978. I was, yeah. 20, I was 20 then. And um, first they said that there were 400 people that died. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, there were bodies under bodies. And then they said it was 900 people, you know, just as an example. So, uh, you know, I start, I start examining everything that I see. Um, you, you know, when I watch a movie, I say, what does this mean? What are they trying to say here? You know, what, you know, like kind of like in mathematics, you know, they say let let's solve for x, or they'll say let's let x equal fifty four or whatever, and then you solve the equation. You know, so I just that that's that's the way my mind works, and uh, there's so uh, you know as we go here in this uh, uh, look 
uh, into Harry Potter and the alchemical marriage. So the alchemical marriage is something that co comes from uh, the Rosicrucian order. And the Rosicrucians are a Masonic order that their, their headquarters are in San Jose, California. And uh, they have a Rosicrucian uh, museum and a Rosicrucian uh, uh, planetarium there, right there, right here in, in California, in, in, uh, in San Jose. So this whole concept of the alchemical marriage is part of their doctrines. I mean, they, they, they have a, a large library and a very influential as a Masonic order across the world. So what is the alchemical marriage? The alchemical marriage is the unity of duality, the most revered and possibly the most powerful union. It is the perfect conjunction, intimate bonding of duality and signifies the pure, deep harmony, which occurs whenever the masculine and feminine elements of nature combine into one. So the alchemical marriage. So all of these characters in Harry Potter mean something. So Harry Potter is the new immortal soul. Hermione Granger, the new mind of the alchemist. And you can look at her name. You can see Hermes in her name. Hermes is the Greek form of, of Thoth or Chihuti, you know, which represents wisdom. So she's the mind of the new alchemist. Ron Weasley is the earthly biological personality. Albus Dumbledore, the radiation from God, the Nos. Nos is Greek for um, mind and uh, uh, or, or, or knowledge and uh, the divine spirit. Rubius Hagrid is, the, is a bodhisattva, the, the gatekeeper, bringing seekers to the path. And a bodhisattva in uh, the uh, Hindu tradition is someone who has achieved enlightenment, but instead of ascending on, that person remains on earth <coughs> to, to lift the consciousness of the rest of humanity, to help lift the consciousness of the rest of humanity. Lily Potter, the divine spark in the heart. James Potter, the, the longing for God. Voldemort, the immortal but sinful higher nature of the human microcosm. Sirius Black, the living plan of God. the Weasley family, the seven chakras and their associated uh, endocrine glands. Neville Longbottom, the medulla oblongata. Severus Snape, the black side of the personality. Remus Lupin, the gray side of the personality. Draco Malfoy, the serpent fire in the spinal cord. Crab and Goyle, the left and right uh, string of the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, uh, Narcissus um, uh, Malfoy, the physical body. Lucius Malfoy, the brain and its feeling of superiority. You might remember in that movie, you know, he always feels like he's, he's above everybody. Dobby, the liberated etheric body in, in the second uh, movie, uh, and the second book, Harry liberates the etheric body uh, creature, the remnant of the old earthly etheric body. Twelve grim raw place, the remnants of the old earthly part of the microcosm, the snitch, the new divine consciousness. So if you read Harry Potter, uh, with this symbolism in mind, the story will transform from an exciting battle between good and evil to a method of absolute liberation from death, suffering, and evil. Uh, so each symbol is linked to a short explanation of symbols on this page. So I'm going to ask Mama Denisha again to uh, make a copy of that um, um, website and put that in the chat for us uh, to um, be able to uh, refer to it. I believe.
leave it up for a couple of seconds. We are at 619. And we got a lot to go. Mm -hmm. So the sun and Christmas, you know, we talk about this all the time. December 21st is the shortest day of the year. And then the, the, the sun uh, seems to die. And uh, it, so it lays, you know, without moving December 22nd, December 23rd, December 24th. And then December 25th is the day that it noticeably lengthens. And that is the birth of the sun. They're not talking about a physical human being. So on one level, thank you. They're on one level, they're, they're, uh, they're talking about, you know, a person that was born in a major in Bethlehem. But on another level, they're really talking about the solar movements. They're talk the star in the east is the, is the star of Sirius. The three kings or the three wise men are the three stars in Orion's belt that points to uh, Sirius. And when the sun is crucified, it goes down into the, to a southernmost hemisphere and is there at the Southern Cross. So that's a short uh, little thing on, on uh, the sun and Christmas. Any questions, any comments? Okay, I'm going to I'm going to plod on. Now, this is another thing you may have heard of. There's a book by George W. Carey. It's called The Word Made Flesh. The Word Made Flesh. And uh, what this talks about is <clears throat> so when you look at the Bible, it's it's looking at it from uh, anatomical this this particular perspective. It's looking at it from an anatomical point of view. So, uh, and, and uh, I, I remember you all, um, Liz and uh, Ron, uh, remember Reverend Robertson, Bobby, I know you remember Reverend Robertson, and he was always telling us that, you know, in the scriptures is revealing actually things that are going on in the Bible and things that are going on astronomically. So uh, this book, The Word Made Flesh, says that the pineal gland is Joseph and that the pituitary gland is Mary and that the spinal cord is the River Jordan and that uh, the Christ, so what's happening here is as above, so below, the uh, claustrum secretes a, 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 an oil uh, once a month in your body that the ancients called the Christos or the Christ. Hmm. So raising the chrism here, we see that the pineal gland secretes the milk, the pituitary gland secretes the honey, and they both come from the same source, which is the claustrum, and sometimes it's referred to as the Santa Claus. Room. You know, and so Santa Claus comes down the chimney bringing good presents. And so the two sacred oils travel down into the solar plexus via the semi uh, lunar ganglion or the pneumogastric nerve, otherwise called the vagus nerve or the wandering nerve. This is the nerve that, that runs, starts at your brain and goes, goes to every uh, gland in your body. And then that, 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 that uh, germ, the fruit of the tree of life, is born in the solar plexus or the manger. You know, and so you, when you look at the word Bethlehem, that means uh, uh, bread of heaven, mm. or, or excuse me, or bread. And then, and then it goes down, all the way down to, to your coccyx or, the, or your, your sacrum or the sacred place. And then here, it shows here in this, in this illustration, the River Jordan. So when they're talking symbolically, the River Jordan is actually representative of the spinal cord. So, uh, you know, early Christians, they knew this, whether it was in 
Hebrew, Greek, they knew these were allegories that, that were based upon the human body. You know, and so they, they knew about the oil that, that uh, came down. So it secretes from the, from the cerebrum, you know, uh, and this happens like, um, um, so yeah. And then when that, when that oil is traveling up, it goes up to where, where was Jesus crucified? Where, what's the place? Anyone know? He was, Gol he was, it was Golgotha, right? Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. You know, and so here I've included. So actually, now I didn't take this particular picture, but I took a picture of this. So this is in the temple of Abydos in Kemet, this one here, where you, we see Tehuti, and he has these two staffs. And also, um, you know, in Kemet, you have this winged sun. You know, and it talk, you know, in the Bible, it talks about the sons of righteousness will come with his healing wings. And so this is, this is uh, all over uh, Kemet. And this is supposed to represent the ascended Christ consciousness. And so when we look at this symbol coming up, the, um, excuse me, let me move this out of the way. Uh, coming up, the uh, spinal cord, the Ida and the Pringala, the left and the right. You know, when we're doing our meditation uh, on Sundays, you know, we're we're breathing in the left, and 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 uh, and uh, you know, um, breathing out. And this this actually strengthens the Ida and the Pringala. And then as we lift up the uh, consciousness, it goes at the top and it goes to the place of the skull. That's where we raise the oil, it's refined and um, put a lot of stuff in here. So every 28 days, 28 and a half days, when the moon is in the sign of the zodiac that your son was, was born in. So like if, you're, if your son is in say um, uh, Gemini or, or Cancer or um, uh, a uh, Leo, whatever. Um, there, there's also a time when the moon is in Leo, or the moon. So that's when the seed is is uh, is is born in you, is is released in you, and uh, this begins to happen at the age of twelve. And it, it, so, if you if you save the seed, if you don't have sex during that that period of two days if you it, you know if you stay away from alcoholic drinks from gluttony that causes ferment uh acid and even alcohol in in the intestinal tract you can actually cause that seed to ascend all right now i'm going to stop there i know that uh, you might have some questions on that so I'm just going to stop and say, hey, are there any questions? One question that comes. <laughs> just one at a time. One at a time. Go ahead, go ahead, Sister. I would just ask you to repeat that one more time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, this, okay, just really quickly. Yes. Really quickly, the, um, the uh, pineal gland is Joseph. Uh, the pituitary gland is Mary. They secrete the milk and the honey. You know, we talk about the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it forms a seed beginning at age 12. It, that, that seed forms in your solar plexus, the house of bread, Bethlehem, house of bread. And then that seed goes all the way down your spine until your sacrum. And then that seed rises up, you know, through mm -hmm. different meditational methods. Okay? Uh, and, um, you know, that seed rises up and crosses over the medulla oblongata and then goes and is crucified. Crucified is, does not mean to kill, but it actually means to, to multiply a thousandfold. And then 
your blood is renewed. Centers in your brain that have been dor dormant uh, turn on, and and you are resurrected as the Christ. So you are raising the Christ within you. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of uh, some some pictures I have seen where initiatives um, after going through various aspects of the of the judgment scene that the initiative receives a, um, a oil cup on his head. Yes. And I was wondering if there was any parallel or anything like that. Associated. You know, m m more than likely it is. Everything that you see like on that judgment scene, you know, is symbolic of something. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, they just didn't say, hey, this would look nice if I put <laughs> this here. You know, it, it, it has a profound meaning, you know, because all of the medu nature and and okay so when i was in kemet so i was I, I was with this group and they don't say medu nature they say sooth they say the sooth language they don't say it's medu nature and so our tour guide and the guy who started the tour they were together we were in the ramesseum and so i asked and so the tour guy is this guy named muhammad fami who i'm going to try to get into this wednesday night class i think he'll I think he'll he'll do it. They're like nine hours ahead. I'll see. You know, you know. I'll, I'll ask him way in advance, and and I'd like for him to. I'd like for him to. I'd like for you guys to be able to to know him and talk to him. And uh, you, you know, he's he's studying to get his PhD in Egyptology. His, he has his master's in Egyptology. You know, he can go to any um, uh, place in Egypt. You know, he just has carte blanche on it, mm -hmm. and he has a profound overstanding of the you know the writings and a profound love so i asked i said fami i said what is it i said is it medu nature or is it sooth and he said well the characters are called medu nature he said but sooth is the higher form of understanding of it so it's just like anything you know the letters have a a meaning you know, so like the letters, a lot of times in, in languages, they'll have a numerical meaning. You know, V means five, X means 10. You know, they'll have, they'll have numerical value and they'll have, they'll have other hidden values in them. And so anything that you see in the Medu nature, in the Suf language has a profound, it, it don't just mean one thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know what? I have more, but I'm going to stop here because.